some of the things we learn from John that are not in the other gospel accounts. The first miracle, where Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. Only John tells us of Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, from whence we get the term born again. Only John tells us of the Samaritan woman at the well, of the woman caught in the act of adultery, of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, of Jesus washing the disciples' feet on the night of his betrayal and arrest, of four soldiers gambling over his seamless garment. But probably the most practical part of John, that he goes into way more detail than the other three gospel writers, we have extensive teaching about the Holy Spirit. Who he is and what he does. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now when Jesus said that, it was still future, but today that's no longer the case. He's in us. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Old Testament characters knew of the Holy Spirit. He would come upon individuals at certain moments in time, like to slay a giant or to survive a lion's den. But now, through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit didn't just come upon us in moments, but he actually lives in all who are born again. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Of course you know it. What does he do? Well, lots of things, but he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And let me just say, if you can experience conviction be very, very grateful. And be the best steward of that conviction that you can possibly be. That's always true, but especially now. Because as lawlessness is increased, has it not increased exponentially? In the last year, Most people's love will grow cold. Guard your heart. If you can experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit, cherish it. Don't harden your heart. Some of the unique characteristics of John, the person. He's called the beloved apostle. He, along with Peter and James, were part of an inner, inner circle with Jesus. Jesus invited them to certain events and things that the other nine were not invited to, apparently, or the other 70, certainly, who the multitudes were not a part of, most notably the transfiguration. But even within the three... It appears John enjoyed a special relationship with Jesus. After Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he commented on one of the disciples who was going to betray him, but he didn't reveal who that was, and so all the disciples then began to freak out, and they were asking who it might be. And so there was reclining on Jesus' breast one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, and that would have been John. Simon Peter therefore gestured to him, gestured to John, and said, tell us who it is whom he is speaking. Peter believed if Jesus would tell anybody, 
he'd tell John. So he's like, ask him. Hey, hey, ask him who it is. He'll tell you. He likes you. Though there's sometimes... We saw rivalry and jealousy amongst the disciples. No one seems to have too hard of a time with John's special relationship with Jesus. John, along with his brother James, were in the fishing business. It was a family business. They would one day inherit from their father, Zebedee. That's a cool name, isn't it? I mentioned the first service. You know, we've got all these young families bringing children, making more children. I want one of these young boys to be named Zebedee. That's just a request I have, because that's a cool, cool name. There's family business they had, and their calling was recorded in Matthew chapter 4. And going from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them And they immediately left the boat and their father and followed them. That's pretty incredible when you think about it. Pretty convicting when you think about it. Zebedee, no doubt, worked his whole life at this business. It's possible that he inherited a fishing business from his father, who inherited that fishing business from his father. So this is a pretty big deal. He would have had a lot invested in these two boys to keep it going. Yet he puts up no opposition to the call of God on his son's lives. Again, with all these young families that we have here in the church, let me encourage you, you can't go wrong releasing your child into the will and the plan of God, into the call of God. It may be a hard road, but it's always the right road. And ultimately, it'd be the best road. They all seem to recognize the importance of Jesus' call. Now, Mark also records that story, and he says that When they left their nets, they left Zebedee with the hired servants. So this successful business had employees. It seemed that even they might have had a cooperative with two other brothers, Peter and Andrew, and they also seemed to um, had the same attitude toward the call of Jesus. I'm going to leave what is familiar and I'm going to follow where you lead me. They get the rap for being ignorant fishermen, maybe unlearned, but they were certainly not stupid people. You have to be pretty smart to operate successful businesses like this and especially sure of the call of God to leave them. Some further interesting factoids about John. He probably owned a home in Jerusalem because as Jesus was dying, he asked John to take care of his mother. And it says that he took her into his house that very day. John was a personal acquaintance of the high priest. Doesn't tell us how he knew the high priest, but he was a personal acquaintance. He was probably very young when he walked with Jesus, maybe 17 or 18, and he was probably very athletic Because when Peter and John ran to the tomb on the third day, John won the race. So much so that he had time to check things out in the tomb before Peter even got there. John, in his early years, was a little bit opinionated and a lot intolerant. And when the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Oh, please, 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 this would be so cool. And Jesus is like, uh, no, that's not what we came to do. But over a course of time, John developed a deep love for people. 
proving that when you agape love people, it can grow. It's a learned and growing response based on intentionality. It is within all of our grasp to love people more deeply tomorrow than we do today by intentionally employing the power of the Holy Spirit to love. John, according to tradition, was the last of the apostles to die when he was in his mid-90s. He was the only apostle to die of natural causes rather than martyrdom, although it's believed he was boiled in oil and survived and then left on a prison aisle, the Isle of Patmos, where he eventually died. So, he did not have an easy life, just a long one. There are two major themes in the life of John, and I'll close with this. We saw them in all three epistles. Love and truth. Both are meant to be fully embraced by us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And remember First John, beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who lo does not love does not know God, for God is love. Hey guys, if you like this content, please consider subscribing for more.